Good morning. It's now 943. Uh, we have a quorum of the board. So the State Board of Education meeting of February 9th is called to order. Approval agenda and order of priority. First item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda and order of priority. Are there any additional items to add or delete from the agenda? I move approval of the agenda. Second. It's been moved and supported. Any questions? Yeah. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Aye. Motion carries. Next is the introduction of uh, State Board of Education members and guests. Marilyn, will you please introduce <coughs> the State Board members and ask the audience to introduce themselves. Sure. So we'll start on my left, and the Chairman of the Board and the State Superintendent is Brian Whiston. And as we go around the table, John Austin is the Board's President. He resides in Ann Arbor. You heard Cassandra Albrich on the phone. She is very close. She's the Board's Vice President. She lives in Rochester Hills. Michelle Fecto is the board secretary. She's from Detroit. Richard Ziley is board member from Dearborn. This year's Michigan Teacher of the Year, who teaches fifth and sixth graders at Birmingham Covington School, is Rick Joseph. Across the table is Karen McPhee. She's the education advisor to Governor Rick Snyder. Next to her, Eileen Weiser, board member from Ann Arbor. Then Kathleen Strauss, board member from Detroit. Lupe Ramos Montini from Grand Rapids. She's the board's NASB delegate, National Association of State Boards of Education. And next to me is Pamela Pugh. She's from Saginaw. She's the board's treasurer. Now, we'd like the audience members to introduce themselves, if you'd kindly do that. Stephen, you or Marty, you want to start? Sure. I'm uh, Marty Ackley, director in the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs here in the Department of Education. Stephen Best in the Office of Education Improvement and Innovation here at the department. Tom Green representing MEA. I'm Paul Getson. I'm from Renaissance Learning and I from the Thomas Township, Michigan. Robert Bryant from Renaissance Learning as well. Uh, born in Detroit but now reside in Bloomfield Hills. Lori Borkon, Renaissance Learning, Wisconsin. Morning, Paul Sala, Wayne Risa. Terrence Lunger, Superintendent, Calhoun Intermediate School District. Judy Pritchett, Macomb Intermediate. Howard Barron, Bloomfield Hills School Board. Amy Colton, Learning Forward, Michigan. Terry Gomes, Education Professional Center, Michigan. Arlene Grayson, Utahs. Sean Camarelli, Coordinated School Health and Safety Unit, here at MBE. Sarah Williams, Coordinated School Health and Safety Unit, down here at MBE. Elizabeth Newell, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Chris Claver, Gongwer News Service. Jacob Cancelo, reporter for MERS News. Ben Williams, legislative liaison for the Department of Education. Good morning, Wendy Larvick from the Office of Public and Governmental Affairs here at MDE. Shalon Daxi with the Office of Great Start with the MDE. Vanessa Kiesler, Deputy Superintendent, Accountability Services. Good morning, Kyle Grant, Deputy Superintendent for Administrative and School Support Services. Susan Norman, Deputy Superintendent, Office of Great Start. Sass, Deputy Superintendent, Educational Services. Allison Henry, the Superintendent's Office here at MBE. Welcome, everybody, to the State Board meeting. I'd like to begin by publicly expressing our sympathy to Melody Arabu and her husband and family on the passing of their six year old son on January 25th after uh, contracting the flu. You may remember that uh, Melody served as the 2014 15 Teacher of the Year and worked very closely with this board and the department for the last couple of years. So. Certainly, uh, our thoughts and prayers go out to her, her husband, and her family. Discussion items. The first item on today's Committee of the Whole agenda is a presentation on strategies for developing Michigan into a top 10 state over the next 10 years. I'd ask Marty to come forward and be prepared to do the presentation. As you are aware, we have been working very hard on developing Michigan a plan to make Michigan a top 10 state over the next 10 years. We've had a wide range of uh, stakeholders, input from the business community, from education, from think tanks, from parents, uh, to concerned citizens, and we appreciate so many people for being involved and helping come up with a solution to making Michigan a top 10 state. On December 8th, the board approved the guiding principles and the strategic goals for developing the plan. Since then, we have been working on developing strategies, and today we'll present those strategies to the board. Later today, you'll see that the top 10 and 10 coordinates very well with the Lieutenant Governor Cali Special Education Reform Task Force work that several of you have been involved with. 
He'll be here to share the findings of the task force this afternoon, and it is part of our top 10 plan in making Michigan a top performer. So we appreciate Marty to be here and walk us through the presentation. Marty. Thank you, Brian. It's very exciting because this is the next step in the process to get us where we all want to uh, want to go to be a top 10 performing state in 10 years. Um, as a review, these are the guiding principles um, and the strategic goals that the board adopted in December. And as a review, also, how, you know, how did we get to these goals and strategies? Um, we did a web survey from September to November. We got a tremendous response from the public, from educators, um, from businesses, um, over 4,200 recommendations, responses from 66 counties across the state. Um, the state board um, received input from 30 education stakeholders in the August and September 2015 board meetings. And of course, as Brian said, you approved the guidelines, uh, the guiding principles and the goals back in December. Um, the stakeholder input from that point, we, they emailed us specific recommendations to the targeted strategies to accomplish the goals. And we met with the stakeholders over two months uh, to further define and refine those strategies. There are meetings here, um, online meetings, and um, the last meeting we had, we broke each goal up into meeting rooms. And <coughs> we had three different sessions for people to, to look at the proposed strategies to um, inform them, also to recommend any suggested changes to them. So that's where we got today. Uh, the comprehensive set of strategies being presented today are geared to addressing each goal, constructing a solid and sustainable P20 system to educate all children for success, meeting and supporting the learning needs of all children, meeting and supporting the professional needs of all educators, designing systems to overcome the disparities experienced by children and schools, to empower parents and families to actively participate in their child's education, partner with employers to develop a strong, educated, and highly skilled workforce, and leading and lifting Michigan education through greater service from Lansing. The strategies uh, provide an overall vision of how Michigan can become a top 10 performing state in 10 years. It doesn't really get into the, the details that will be in the next process, but what we did was we took, I'm just gonna take each goal here and show some, some targeted strategies that are included in that. This is not all the strategies under these goals, but goal one, uh, targeted strategies include things like expanding access to quality public, publicly funded preschool for all four-year-olds by 2020, the year 2020, and then all three-year-olds by the year 2025. Also enhancing uh, high school career and college guidance capacity and training. Uh, for goal two, uh, we include strategies like high quality multi-tiered system of supports, also known generally as universal education and high career and college ready standards for and expectations of all children. So we want to make high standards uh, for all of our students. Goal three, some of the targeted strategies include uh, a new system of training and, and induction of educators based on the model of novice practicing and master levels, uh, coherent and state and district provided professional development, of course, jointly developed with educators based on the needs of each teacher. Also included in this um, goal are strategies to support an effort leading to more national board certification for Michigan teachers. For goal four, this, uh, some of the start, uh, targeted strategies include access to school health services through expansion of school nursing, school mental health services, and school-based health centers. Address the differential cost of providing high quality education to students and target resources accordingly. Another strategy included in this goal, equitable access across the state to career and technical education and special education resources. Goal five, empowering parents and families to actively participate in their children's education. Some of the targeted strategies include expanding access to coordinated and free health services and family advocacy supports and implementing the PTA's national standards for family school partnerships. Goal six, partner with employers to develop a strong, educated, and highly skilled workforce. Some of the targeted strategies include uh, coordinate with the Workforce Debe Development Agency, employers, and other stakeholders to increase internships, work-based learning opportunities, and service learning for students. And another strategy includes all students, including but not limited to students with disabilities, 
to have access to career and tech ed and post-secondary options. And goal seven, leading and lifting Michigan education through greater service from Lansing. Uh, some of the targeted strategies include the state board, state superintendent, and education stakeholders working together on policy issues to raise student achievement and support local school districts and support and implement the recommendations of the governor's special education reform task force. As Brian said, Lieutenant Governor will be here this afternoon to unveil um, that report. So you can see the strategies um, span the breadth of a person's educational experience from early childhood through K-12 and post-secondary opportunities for all children to the important role of parents and guardians, ensuring a strong workforce, and nurturing responsible and informed citizens. Now the next steps after the board receives this report today formally and officially, the next steps include a more detailed action plan uh, being developed that includes timelines, prioritizing the strategies, establishing desired outcomes, the implementation of the of these strategies, and of course measuring the success. So that's where we are now, and I'll hand it back to Brian. Additional next step, of course, is the governor and his state of state address the, the issue of creating a commission moving forward to talk about uh, other things that are in the way of creating a strong educational system. And he mentioned then, he also mentioned tying the top 10 and 10 in. So we certainly look forward to working with the governor uh, on his task force uh, moving education forward. I will tell you that whenever you do this, it's kind of a messy process because you're getting a lot of groups together and, uh, you know, everybody wants their recommendations in the report. And what we've tried to do is, you know, get the legislature, the business community, education community, the state board, all of us marching in the same direction, which of course means all of us have to, we give and take a little bit in that process. And I appreciate everybody's willingness to do that because the ultimate goal is to keep all of us on the same page moving forward and creating a vision for what it takes to make us a top 10 state. And as we have been visiting with business leaders and educators and the governor's office and legislative leaders, I think there's an appreciation for the work that's been done and to, to try to set out a vision to make Michigan a top 10 performing state. So I think this really is an exciting opportunity, uh, even though it's a messy process to uh, get us uh, to becoming a top 10 state and I'm really looking forward to uh, the board's continued uh, direction and continual leadership in making this happen. So with that, questions, comments from the board? I see John, please. I'd like to make a couple comments on the direction and the, first the virtues of this agenda. I mean, I, I do appreciate very much Brian and all the collaborative process. There's been a, a lot of good work to try to integrate uh, the thinking and agendas of many stakeholders and trying to help us get on a page. And I do think there is so much in here that is consistent with where we need to go and what top performing states do that does move the needle in terms of student achievement, which is our, our goal. Um, investing consistently in having high expectations for all students, high standards, helping our teachers get the support and professional development they need, enhancing early childhood education, making sure all students get uh, the opportunity for early post-secondary credit and career technical <coughs> education and putting more resources where we need it where kids have further to travel due to poverty and other conditions uh, and holding all schools accountable of whatever sort for whether they're delivering the goods so I think these are the right directions for us to move uh, in terms of uh, hitting that goal I just do want to note uh, I think one thing that we're not yet attending to as a state that does affect student performance is the need to um, get our arms around the uh, policy that we've enabled that has allowed new schools to open uh, anywhere without any plan or purpose for how this improves educational quality uh, or how it's responsive to community need. Um, according to the Citizens Research Council, over the last 10 years, our student enrollments have dropped by over 200,000 kids, and we have uh, increase in our school district from 560 to over 800 schools. Um, we're seeing play out dramatically in Detroit, the impact of this kind of marketplace for public education, but it's also happening in many other communities across Michigan. Uh, we've got too many schools chasing too few students and the dollars that flow with them, and it is impacting student achievement. And uh, while we must work together to move forward on all of these strategies that are powerful, 
contributors to enhance it to an achievement. We need to, as a state, uh, <coughs> more to wrestle with uh, the nature of how and when we allow schools to open so that we're ensuring that they deliver greater learning outcomes for all of our students. Richard, please. And then, as, as we continue in this process, I'm very concerned that we not mistake uh, means and ends. And a good example is the goal of more nationally certified teachers. Presumably that's a means to the end of uh, higher achieving students. Uh, so just, just with that caveat as we go forward, uh, and um, I think that uh, uh, in the past we have mistaken uh, credentials, for example, for competency. We've mistaken uh, teacher certification for the ends of student achievement. Um, and, and then we, uh, we put those, those presumed means into place and then we're surprised when the ends don't follow. So I, I think we need to focus on the ends and be clear uh, as we go forward. Elaine, please. Um, uh, uh, several of us, including Michelle, who was quite eloquent in a recent email, are really concerned about educator preparation, and it falls into a gray area for um, administering change, which is that the colleges and universities are completely independent of us, and yet we are in control, the department is, for the quality of the programs. Uh, it's worth it to say that, uh, some, repeat a couple of anecdotes, unfortunately anecdotes, that I've seen recently, which is first of all that the iPad kids, the kids who've been swiping iPads since they were two, are now in kindergarten. And uh, uh, my son's class had about a quarter of the kids failing as they went into their first trimester exams, I think, in part, because learning styles are different now than teaching styles. So it's really important that as we look at all of this that there's a, uh, a connection point made by the department uh, with uh, what K-12 students need to have in the classroom uh, through uh, not only the, uh, 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 the professional development in the schools but right on up to the educator pre preparation because unless we are able to knock on that door effectively develop a, a common vision and um, and make the changes, help them make the changes that are necessary, we're going to be in a cycle where we don't have properly trained teachers despite the changes that we know are necessary in K-12. So I would beg everybody's patience with that because that, that, that's an autonomous adventure that we do not control uh, completely and it's going to take a lot of goodwill. But as you know, we are forming a committee to deal with that issue and work working jointly with the colleges, the legislature, because we do agree that we've got a lot of work to be done there. Agreed wholeheartedly. Other comments? Kathleen, please. Well, <clears throat> I think the process was worthwhile in itself. Uh, it was a very, I think, a very productive exercise of bringing all the education groups together and having them be part of this and, and have, have feel a responsibility and an ownership. I think that part is really critical and very to be commended. I think that was a good mm -hmm. move on your part. So I think that's that's very important. And I think overall, I might, I might quibble with a couple of the things that it, but overall it's it's a it's a good document, and I think it's it's certainly worth using as a guidepost to where what we're going to be doing. And I personally was very glad to see the addition of more recognition of the importance of becoming citizens, people becoming good active, informed citizens in addition to being either college or career. I think that, that has been glossed over so much in the last five, ten years. It's, I think it's been to our detriment. I was glad to see that that was using along with what John said and, and, and I mean for that matter. So, uh, but I think the process itself is really good. Yeah, I hope and the then stakeholders Rick. really do feel a commitment to work together and uh, get where we should be going. Thank you. Lupe and then Rick. I commend you, you and the staff, uh, for this document. You have been with us for, I think, seven months. And in those seven months, this has been produced uh, together with <coughs> the staff. Uh, the I agree with Kathy, the, the fact that you and your staff included so many different stakeholders into the formation of this document is 
commendable. Uh, it, it was, like, like you say, a messy, a messy task, but it's a task that you put into a document that now we have a focal point that we can uh, continue with that student achievement that we so covet in, in our roles as educators. So I will be voting uh, in the affirmative for the adoption, uh, what, the, uh, what Marty said, the formal and official adoption of this document. Uh, so I commend you for your work. I certainly want to echo what Lupe just said and commend this, the department on this work. It, it, it's, um, it's critically important to have these strategic goals articulated so well, and I know that there was a tremendous amount of work and a tremendous amount of energy that went into collecting these and articulating these and developing these. As I travel around the state, I'm, I'm, I'm made constantly aware in my conversations with educators about the inequities that exist systemically, and so I'm, I really want to highlight goal number four. I really have a, a particular appreciation for um, the, these priorities because they're so vital um, in bringing all of our stakeholders together, the legislators, uh, business community, and our state board, so that we can all work together in concert to address these issues. So thank you. Thank you. Michelle and Pam. <coughs> um, yeah, I, I think um, the uh, work and the ideas, um, uh, all that was incorporated in this, it's, I think it's a, it's a successful document. I think it's a, um, a, a, a tremendously um, useful document. Um, and I wanted to call out some of the things I particularly liked. Um, uh, I like the, in goal number four, that medical model. Um, I think that's wonderful. And I, I've always uh, thought of also that um, uh, student teachers should be paid <laughs> and uh, be treated more as apprentices um, uh, and, and uh, mm -hmm. in that role. So I, I hope, hopefully that's part of that. Um, the recognition of the effects of poverty uh, the supports for educators, the recognition um, and of the needs, special needs for certain communities, including special education, um, and the, the positive behavior um, supports that uh, looking at alternative ways to diminish the um, suspensions and expulsions. I am I'm really pleased to see all of that incorporated. Um, in, and as we move forward and sort of fill in how, how all of this actually hits the ground. Um, I know there's a lot of focus on um, uh, career and college readiness, uh, but I, I want to make sure that kids with uh, disabilities are included in that, even if it means that their um, transition to s something beyond education might be supported uh, employment or um, <coughs> things where um, they, they can have a meaningful life even though it may not be the traditional college career path and that they're prepared all along as any other student to reach their full potential. I think that's um, in here and I just want to make sure that it's, it's, uh, it's remembered as we move forward. So, thank you. And I like Michelle and, and following behind Rick and Lupe, I, well, first of all, just commend this work and Brian for you hitting the ground running and being able to produce this so quickly and set us on this trajectory to know where we're going. Um, you know, one of the things that I continue to say is that I would love for us to be much more explicit as it taught as we speak about those who are, um, as we talk about the equity gaps, um, and we know that um, Afri minorities, particularly African American males, um, there are huge gaps there, and I just don't want us, I, I don't want us to lose out, and I don't think that we are. Uh, I, obviously, we've talked about it a lot, and we know uh, where we want to go, but also being able to make sure that all those throughout the education system are okay with knowing, you know, where the concentration needs to lie um, on these uh, most impacted communities, which are our African American males, um, or minority males. So, um, and I know we were just a little bit more explicit in our previous uh, goals or strategies maybe um, as it related to that. But overall, um, really uh, pleased with the document and the direction that this um, is sending us in. So as I, you know, have been working with the board on a reorganization plan along the top 10, we're also gonna be adopting a one major goal and the major goal that we are gonna be 
proposing to the board is what you just said. So we're very much in tune to that. All right. Yep, Kevin. Well, we can't do it here. We do it in the afternoon. What's that? I want to make a motion, but we can't do it here at this point. We can if you make it. Yeah, we're not in the uh, proper. Uh, okay. Right. We'll wait till this afternoon. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. <coughs> yep, John. What you're obviously hearing is um, tremendous appreciation for your leadership in helping us uh, lay out this roadmap. Yes, because um, I'm ready to make it too. Unanimous support, I believe, to help us drive this forward. So thank you. Very much appreciate all the leadership of the board. Good. Next item on the Committee of the Whole Agenda is presentation on the 2016-18 Child Care and Development Fund State Plan. <coughs> the Child Development and Care Program in Michigan provides low-income families with access to high-quality child care opportunities. Due to the significant program rule changes, Michigan has begun working towards implementing uh, program changes related to health and safety requirements for child care providers family-friendly eligibility policies and providing transparent information <coughs> to parents about child care choices. During this presentation, staff will share information on the Child Care and Development Fund State Plan. Our next step is the MDE will submit the Child Care and Development Fund State Plan on March 1, 2016. Here presenting today are Susan Bowman, Deputy Superintendent Great Start, and Lisa uh, Brewer well, Walraven. Director of Child Development and Care. Sorry about that. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you and good morning everybody. We're pleased to be able to present this plan for you because in simple terms, this is a massive dose of quality improvement for child care in Michigan. As Lisa goes through the, the plan and the work, you will see the incredible amount of opportunity Michigan has to improve different aspects of the child care system. Yeah. Work is just beginning and is going to ramp up in earnest in this next year on all of the different implementation plans that we need to do. So here's a high level overview of how Michigan is responding to the reauthorization. Um, just a, a bit of brief background to um, get us all again familiar with the program. This is a block grant that states receive to serve children birth through 12 um, from low income families to ensure that they have access to high quality early learning programs whether they're full day programs or before and after school opportunities, as well as a focus on how we can um, implement strategies to increase the quality of those programs. So as Susan mentioned, this is a plan, um, a little bit new with reauthorization. Now we will submit this plan every three years. And due to the timing of reauthorization, this plan is due March 1st this year. Um, even though we've already started in the fiscal year that the plan is um, representing. Um, it shows on this slide uh, our main focuses. Of course, the Office of Child Care um, wants us to diligently work with partners to ensure the implementation of this block grant. So the Office of Great Start um, doesn't do all of these pieces alone. We rely on many partners to help us uh, determine subsidy, to work on child care licensing and to increase the quality of care. Um, we did utilize several partners in helping develop this plan. Um, constituent groups, parents, and providers were included as well. This next slide is a slide that I believe you've seen before, but we like to include it to help give you a historical picture of this block grant in Michigan. Um, you can see that our appropriations follow the number of cases that we have for this program. So historically, our appropriation has been based on the number of cases for the program. And just to give you a sense of what that looked like when we had the higher level of funding compared to our last year's funding, when we had funding at about $490 million, we were serving 122,000 children compared to last year when our funding was at around 119 million and we were only serving um, 29,000 children. So 
uh, you can, can kind of follow that um, through that graphic. Our goal is to continue. Quick question. On the, on the graph, you've got uh, 2003, 67,000, and 215, 16,733, and the number for children was different from the number of cases. Just how, did, how does that mesh? Sure. So uh, family applies for the subsidy, and we count those cases. Okay. Um, but then we also count the number of children associated with those cases. Okay, thank so you. So that's, that's okay. where that number is. Um, so Susan mentioned our goal is to continue to implement the changes of reauthorization to expand access and to ensure that we're best serving the children and families in Michigan. So this block grant came into existence in 1996 and in November of 2014 it was the first time it was reauthorized. So significant changes were implemented to really make it a dual purpose block grant for states making sure that we're promoting economic self-sufficiency for the parents, as well as making sure that we're um, providing for healthy development for children and ensuring school readiness. Um, across states, territories, and tribes, this is a $5.3 billion program that's working to achieve those goals. Um, this next slide and the slide that's following really gives you a high-level overview of what the enhanced purposes of reauthorization are. Um, one of those is to ensure states uh, maximum flexibility. That is new under the reauthorized block grant. It's also about making sure parents have choice to meet their needs. So making sure states are expanding those choices. It has a very high emphasis on consumer education and transparency of information for both providers and parents. Um, they want to make sure that we're helping support families as their child is developing and growing. It also makes sure that we are ensuring that there's an increased number of high quality programs that are available to support children and families. It also has a high emphasis on health and safety, so some significant changes related to what would be required of providers who are caring for the children. And again, an increased emphasis on ensuring that we're helping facilitate the opportunities for families with low incomes to have access to high quality care. Um, some of the scope of the reauthorization um, has increased um, requirements for background checks and more inspections and monitoring for child care providers. That really gets at the health and safety provisions. Increase in stability of care, so stability of care for parents who are trying to reach self-sufficiency, stability of care for the children so they can remain in high quality settings, and stability for providers who are caring for those children. Um, increasing transparency for parents and providers, making sure that they are aware of all policies and procedures, and they have information that is useful to them as they are um, working with the providers. And um, we'll talk in a minute more, but these uh, changes are sort of phased in with some different implementation dates. This slide gives you some high-level topics of the key areas in reauthorization. We posted a draft in December, as well as a summary sheet that highlighted these changes. Um, and um, many of these items um, have already been touched on. This slide um, shows you the chart of some of the dates that we are required to implement these changes. You'll see that it's really a range from September 30th of this year to November 19th of 2017. So some, most of the provisions are required for September 30th of 2016, but there are some that extend into 2017. There is also a waiver pr provision, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute as well. So with the enormity of reauthorization, the Office of Child Care 
um, is allowing states to create implementation plans for items that they know they will not be in compliance with by March 1st of this fiscal year. Um, we currently have 14 implementation plans. Uh, those were also posted when we posted the plan and the summary sheet uh, for um, everyone to review and see. Those really range from policy changes to changes that need to happen with child care licensing rules to looking at child care provider rates to looking at strategies to help increase access to care to looking at how we can better serve homeless children and those uh, improvements for consumer education. So there are a wide range of, of plans and, and activities. Um, as we come into compliance, with those items, we will simply be amending our plan to demonstrate that compliance. Uh, we also have a provision for waivers or um, temporary extensions. Those, again, have to be submitted to the Office of Child Care when we submit our plan on March 1st. Um, there are two reasons that a state can request these waivers. Um, one is called an extraordinary circumstance. And that means that we've had a natural disaster or we have a financial crisis. The second is um, for pending legislative actions. So one example of a waiver that we would be requesting is around the areas where we have to change our child care licensing rules. There's a process for changing those rules that includes the legislature and an ad hoc committee. Um, and those will extend beyond some of the deadlines. So we will have to uh, request that for those. We've had several opportunities for comments and input. Um, we use several partners to build this plan, as well as, again, reaching out to those constituent groups and parents and providers. All of uh, the information, the implementation plans, the summary document, the plan were posted in mid-December. Then we used an email strategy to reach out through listservs. Uh, we posted on Facebook, we sent to our partners and asked them to send out to their listservs. So we had child care licensing helping us, the Great Start Collaboratives helping us, ISDs helping us, as many people as possible um, to share this opportunity for feedback. We did hold a public hearing. People were able to come to that in person as well as we broadcasted it via webinar. And then we held two other webinar opportunities, one during the day and one in the evening, to try and expand opportunities for participation. Um, we know there was some interest in the topic. There were 475 clicks to see what the webinar was about. Um, we had 87 people who attended our hearings via webinar, as well as 46 people who attended in person. Um, and we have been receiving comments. Um, through uh, an email and written uh, based on those opportunities. We also had an opportunity to share with this with to the OGS Advisory Council in late January. Um, and public sector consultants uh, was doing some focus groups with providers. And while they weren't official comments related to the plan, we have been able to look at those to see if they help us with any of the activities related to the plan. Some of our most common comments are around the criminal history check requirements. That does require that everyone receives an FBI fingerprint check. Um, so people are worried about some duplicity with that, the cost of that, um, and exactly who will be required to have those fingerprints. Uh, we also had several comments on wages for child care providers and requesting that child care wages be increased or rates for providers be increased. We are accepting comments through February 15th. We'll be able to look at those comments and either see if they're relevant to the submission of the plan, if they're relevant to the implementation plan work that has to happen, or potential future changes that we would make for the program. And we will be working very hard to get that plan submitted on March 1st. Uh, like Susan said, to begin the hard work and really the fun work of being able to make these changes for children and families. So we're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Eileen? 
So, given the fact that there's an, uh, there's uh, the, the ability to grant temporary extension waivers and the extraordinary circumstances that have happened in Flint, is there an opportunity to recognize um, uh, new work plans in Flint? And if that's the case, uh, are there other places too that haven't endured hardships that I'm not aware of? Is there an opportunity to do yeah. what, Eileen? So there's a there's a temporary extension of waiver yeah. uh, opportunity, and right. I, given what's happened in Flint, I I wondered how the plan was being modified, oh. or if it could be, uh -huh. and if Flint is the only situation that we're the only place that we have right now that's going through okay. some that's, significant yeah. hardships that okay. would warrant um, some sort yeah, of change. Good question. I certainly think there are there are certain places in the plan itself in the requirements where they want you to focus on underserved populations or areas of great need. So I think there are definitely opportunities to look at at that. The situation in Flint is such that it has been declared an emergency, right? And so there are provisions within CCDF to address child care needs in a community that has been declared an emergency. So there will be uh, some differences, and we'll modify our plan, not even this one, sooner, to address that, to deal with the situation in Flint where we'll change eligibility requirements and, and different things like that, if the legislature approves uh, additional so I, I saw an unsettling uh, Education Commission of the State's uh, analysis yesterday of uh, pre-school pre, uh, care and services and education in Ohio. And Ohio State is looking at the fact that for the programs they've had in existence, the gains that children made that were registered when they walked into kindergarten or first grade have disappeared by the time they're hitting middle school. And uh, you know it's impossible to know they'll be studying it over the next five years. The, the cohort that will have give us that information though is not here now. Um, but uh, I've, I've wondered whether uh, there's more research going on and how we try to, to help the K or K through five people use what those children have learned and what we hope the Clint kids will be uh, experiencing an intensive support for pre preschool. Uh, in a way that, that allows them to scoot on through and keep those gains. Nothing yet. Well, there are different, you probably could talk to it. <laughs> um, there are different proposals about the research. Um, okay. Different entities are looking at providing research. I don't think there's anything at this point that I'd say is solid, but given what has happened, this is an unusual situation where you could say this is an opportunity yes to really ramp up all of the services that young children need and in general, but in this situation, given the extreme emergency and the issues with lead, that this is an opportunity to really provide universal services for all of these young children and to watch the development over time. And there are plans that yes. will be forthcoming. The research, yeah. Right. Well, and, and the services to services and research. And, yeah. and and the concern that I have is whether there's any research that's ahead of Ohio State's because um, you know the problem may not lie with the preschool. The problem may yes. lie with and probably does lie with what's happening in K through five. Right. Well, and that's some of where I say Head Start gets a really bad rap um, because they say okay the the learning fades by the time <coughs> children at Head Start get to third grade. Well, it's like, well, where did they go to school? Right. And what happened after they actually left Head Start? And is the quality of each of the grades sufficient and the support sufficient to keep the gains made in Head Start and or GSRP going as children go through the first few years? And I completely grade. understand that. So. All right, thank you very much. We're now going to move to the regular meeting. It's 1027 and a quorum of the board is present. So we'll call to order the regular meeting. Approval of the minutes of the regular and committee of the whole meeting of January 12th, 2016. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. It's been moved. Is there support? Supported. Moved and supported. Any questions? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed the same. Ayes have it. We'll move to the president's report, please. Thanks, Brian. And one, just wanted to note uh, we have a uh, process underway to um, 
evaluate our new superintendent? Does it feel like you're new? Yeah, <laughs> seven months. I don't know. I think I feel dog years. I've been here a while. <laughs> great staff, though. Great things going on. Don't take that wrong. How many dogs? <laughs> so uh, everybody has a, uh, a document for, um, that we developed together to frame the um, feedback uh, on Brian, which please um, execute, and we'll come together. I believe we'll do that formally our next meeting is that correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so I just wanted to remember, thank you Brian, to note that that process is underway um, and appreciate uh, all that you've done in the short tenure you're here, including laying out the uh, roadmap for us with the top ten. Um, a couple of items I wanted to talk about briefly. One, obviously all of us as we just were discussing are um, eager to ensure that the Flint, and Flint school kids uh, get what they need to cope with uh, the crisis and appreciate what's being done from here and so appreciate Brian on our behalf you're working hard to uh, not only release money but ensure that the ISD and the Flint schools and others were working together on delivering all the education screening nutrition and other services that are essential and uh, there is an nothing more important than to get those things going. So thank you for helping us make sure that that's happening and hope you'll flag any issues where we can uh, need to be helpful to improve. So, um, you know, as urgently in uh, Detroit, the situation with the schools there, I know many of us have been um, spending some time uh, in Detroit, both seeing the schools, um, talking to community members, coalition members, uh, the uh, DPS uh, board members about um, how we can all work together to reinforce the importance of the kind of uh, fix for the learning in Detroit, which is what we need to focus on. And um, delight, happy there's legislation introduced and appreciate the governor's uh, proposals on same. Um, I think as we all are going to reiterate, I think this afternoon with our legislative committee. Uh, and we want to continue to reinforce, I think, the understanding of what will be important to have in that legislation uh, in order for it to um, help create conditions where the kids in Detroit can learn. And they're not learning. Uh, the um, achievement is not what it need, must be, and we're not providing the help. So uh, I think, as you all saw, um, and Brian, appreciate your testimony last week, we continue to need to reinforce the legislature and help their understanding of what's important to, to do to fix the problems. We need to lift that debt of the state's debt um, before it grows. Uh, with so much of the funding going off to pay the debt, um, it's clear that's contributing to the learning environment not being what it needs to be with teachers and facilities in Detroit, in the Detroit public schools itself. Um, we definitely want to encourage strongly that we return local um, governance to the Detroit schools uh, so they can own and operate their own system uh, and we need some mechanism that does manage for quality and access all of the public schools in Detroit um, I think some of you may have seen the mayor's presentation last week which was an excellent summary we have a situation as I alluded to before where we're seeing both saturation of the market with new schools and chaos in terms of how that uh, learning environment, how the schools are available and how they are performing. Um, the mayor's presentation noted uh, we've seen 164 schools opened or closed in the last seven years in Detroit, DPS and charters. Uh, there are neighborhoods like Northeast Detroit, which has 6,000 students with two high schools. And downtown has 11, 1,800 students with 11 high schools. Uh, community in southwest Detroit has seen 12 schools open and close just in the last year and a half. Um, and I think our colleague, former colleague Dan Varner, I saw was pointing out in a debate on this topic, we have 30,000 more seats than we have school children in Detroit. And it is affecting the finances and then the learning outcomes of all schools. There are good charters that are undersubscribed that don't have enough students. Uh, DPS, which often has those more special education uh, kids, more with learning needs, have diminished resources. Uh, and we, we see multiplication of schools that don't deliver education. Um, so until we uh, attend to this as part of DPS, 
uh, and the Detroit public schools, uh, the finances just for DPS will continue to erode uh, and can lift the debt, but if you don't uh, create some way to manage all public schools for quality and access, uh, we'll be bite right back here in three or four years um, bailing out DPS again with the saturation of new schools that is, uh, and not all of them are quality. So that's an important feature of what we need to accomplish as a state if we really want to create conditions that allow all public school children, DPS and others attending public schools to get the education that they deserve. Um, and I hope we will continue to reiterate that uh, and help us all understand that. Uh, and this situation of um, a marketplace of public education is also uh, impacting non-DPS communities around the state. And again, it needs to be something we attend to as part of how we deliver quality education. Um, I appreciate it very much, uh, the staff here, uh, Rick and others, who uh, have been developing the um, additional guidance that I hope we'll give in a couple months for how schools can support, embrace, and empower LGBTQ and particularly trans students who are now happily coming forward in our schools. And I was delighted to attend a uh, gathering of educators and uh, uh, LGBT community activists um, and celebrate the fact that uh, we are um, going to provide additional help and support and guides for schools who want to know how they can best support trans students uh, and help them be comfortable and then learn. And so it's wonderful and I appreciate everybody's hard work on that. It's an important way we send a message that we're welcoming and empowering all of our students. Uh, and so thank you for uh, great work and which will be coming forward soon on that. My report. Hey, moving on to the report of the superintendent. So on January 15th, many of us did visit some Detroit public schools as part of a tour from Representative Sherry Gay Diag. Daniel, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> um, but I think it was a very good day where we got an opportunity to see some good things going on in classrooms and see some challenges. So I appreciate the, all of you who are able to attend that. Also on February 4th, I did a tour of Lance Cruz schools and was able to see students in the kindergarten uh, year one and then first grade year two uh, speaking in Mandarin and Chinese as they were learning in an immersion program. And just uh, the opportunity that those students are getting is marvelous. Then went on to see their CTE programs, wide breadth of programs, you know, learning to be teachers, you know, law enforcement, work on cars, uh, work on TV and radio uh, across the board. They even had me paint something. I'm not sure I'll show you what I painted, but uh, <laughs> I did paint something uh, at one of the schools. And just tremendous work. And then I got to go to Clarkston Schools and, uh, again, celebrate some uh, the Chinese New Year uh, last Friday night in a program for the uh, Oxford Schools. Um, and so got to see their immersion program and students uh, that are there and about 80, 90 students who are... Uh, from China who are studying in the schools and the work that they're doing. So there are a lot of good things that are going on in our schools that we need to learn from and celebrate. And we are creating as uh, we move forward this warehouse of promising practices so that other districts can learn from them on these visits. And I remind you, not only am I doing these visits, but all the managers in the department are doing these visits. And we'll be visiting over 300 schools this year, plus whatever your visits you guys are doing. Kathleen? want to say when we visited the schools in Detroit that day, one of the schools was a foreign language immersion program. We talk about kindergartners learning Mandarin Chinese. We, saw, we, we observed a fourth grade math class conducted in Chinese. <laughs> wow. I'm assuming that they were answering the teacher correctly because she was they have <laughs> they were probably talking about all of us in the room but <laughs> yeah, I, I was just astonished numbers. that they could do that in fourth grade they're learning math and chinese yeah very and exciting the opportunities the same, but the rest of it is it's just fascinating hmm. yeah. so so with all the troubles that detroit schools have there's some good things going on absolutely there. and the children are, the children are eager to learn their you know, the, Mm -hmm. They're as cute as ch little children are. Yeah, they're adorable. <laughs> and they want to learn. Mm -hmm. And they are. They're learning. It's really very impressive. So this past week, I also, me and the team, provided testimony to a joint uh, Senate Education and Senate uh, Appropriations Committee on what we're doing to support struggling schools and our partnership with the SRO and our partnership with Treasury and working with schools, whether they're financially or academically challenged. 
some of the good work that's being done by uh, the success in the SRO and success in the department about moving schools forward and what we've learned from those successes and sharing with other schools. So some very good movement on uh, some of those uh, priority lists and, and helping schools who were in the bottom 5% who now are in the 50 to 80 percentile because of the good work being uh, done across the board. I also testified, as John said, uh, in the Senate on the Detroit uh, package before the uh, Senate Government Operations Committee and so provided testimony that we shared with the board on both of those committees. We've actually been invited back to the Senate Ed and Senate Approach Joint Committee next uh, Tuesday to finish testimony because they really liked the engagement and conversation that was taking place. So we'll be back before them testifying next Tuesday. As John mentioned on Flint Water, I signed all the paperwork necessary yesterday to flow money uh, to the Flint schools and uh, G uh, Genesee ISD. Uh, we've shared a breakdown of funding with you that's nine school nurses uh, that the district can hire and I talked to the superintendent on Sunday and they're working through a process uh, to do that right now. We've provided additional nutrition, food services, not only directly through the schools, through Genesee ISD, because not only the 5,000 kids in Flint, but the other 10,000 kids who live in Flint but go to surrounding schools. We have to remember we have to impact all those students, plus about five, 6,000 kids who are birthed uh, and not in school yet, birth through five. So we're working not only through the schools, but uh, Diane and I were on a conference call this weekend with uh, a group of people who provide food through the nonprofit services and making sure that we're coordinating our activities to make sure parents have multiple opportunities to get the food and nutrition they need. So uh, additionally, Genesee ISD is going to be providing early on services, uh, birth through for for the first year, extending that and providing services to all students, uh, as well as providing some uh, uh, coordination on the food and vegetables, communications, and wraparound services that needs to be done. So uh, the governor will be releasing some more plans. Everything I just discussed was in the 1516 supplemental. The governor will be releasing some things tomorrow for 1617 and probably talking about some things for 1718. So much more to come much more services and support that the department, not only our department, but multiple departments are providing to help Flint be successful. Kyle and I also serve on the governor's Flint Water Interagency Coordinating Committee, and we have had a couple meetings in Flint and a couple phone conversations where we're coordinating uh, all the activity to make sure we're meeting needs of the Flint residents on this most difficult situation. As you know, we also have a school in Flint, the Michigan School for the Deaf, and of course, we've uh, been working with them since this summer to take action on the water. Uh, we re they've replaced 67 faucets to date, two water fountains to date, one more uh, is being replaced. So the kids who, who uh, go there for school have been using bottled water all school year. The issue has really been the kids who stay there during the week and the showers and those kinds of things. And so we replaced all that. and the. The department will be going out and t retesting the water to make sure everything is okay so that we can continue to meet the needs of the students in the Michigan School for the Deaf. And I just want to say I want to thank our staff, uh, Terry Chapman and, and Kyle and everybody that has been working very hard on that to be on top of this uh, going back even to summertime. So it's a good example of good work being done by people to make sure we're taking care of the, the students that we're in charge of. As I mentioned, we're going through a process of, off process of uh, reorganizing the department to meet not only my management style, but to meet the needs of top 10 and 10, meet the needs of our major goal that we will be proposing, uh, and also just to, to really have a conversation about how do we do the difficult work with the limited staff we have. We have an outstanding staff here that really wants to meet the needs of students, and we want to align our services to make sure that we are providing the support needed to school districts to move forward and become a top 10 performing state. That's not only struggling schools, but also schools who are ready to charge forward. The real exciting opportunity we have on the reauthorization of Every Student Succeeds Act really is going to give us a really unique opportunity to engage in how we want to move forward as a state. We're going to work very closely with Karen and her team and the governor's office with the legislature and really provide an opportunity for teachers, administrators, parents, business leaders to have some say in how we're going to move forward in a new system of really providing support to help schools be successful, 
hopefully at least step away from the thought of punishing first but making sure schools understand they need to uh, be successful and if they haven't been successful over a number of years then we do need to provide a partnership of intervention to help them move forward so this really is an exciting time uh, to be involved in education for not only top 10 but that we really get to write our future in, in this every student succeed act and it's going to be an exciting opportunity for all of us uh, to be engaged and lead that conversation and I'm very much looking forward to that We'll be coming up with a plan for uh, the department in terms of how we want to proceed in this, but it's going to be a very open process, uh, a lot of uh, giving a lot of opportunity for, for people to provide uh, thought and direction into how we do this so that we get it right and we move forward and we look back five to ten years from now and really take pride in that we have moved the state forward. So just a really exciting opportunity right now, and I'm glad we're all get to be part of that. So. With that, we'll move to the report of the Michigan Teacher of the Year, Rick. Yeah, you have, to, you have to slow down. You got an hour just to Let's move some things. I can fill all day. <laughs> so, what can we move up here? There's participation. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Brian. Um, Thank you. As I travel around the state, I'm, I'm impressed with the incredible breadth um, of the work that goes on both among um, educators in schools and parents in the community and, of course, the, the hard work of the state board members here at the table. And so this first slide showcases National Board Certified Teachers. And I'm, as a National Board Certified Teacher, a middle childhood journalist, I'm very excited to hear that part of the top 10 and 10 enshrines the importance of um, of trying to, to, to add to the number of National Board certified teachers in the state of Michigan. The National Board um, began its work in, in Southfield, Michigan in 1986, and there was a great um, initiative to really create standards that um, enabled everyone to know what effective teachers should know and be able to do. And that's the premise behind National Board certification that, of course, um, the, the National Board would do for education what the AMA did for medicine what the uh, American Bar Association did for law to sort of try and codify um, effective standards that would help drive effective teaching and learning and of course impact um, the classrooms th th throughout our nation and, and that's largely what has happened and there's research that shows that um, National Board Certified Teachers students have um, performed better than non-National Board Certified Teachers and, and, and it's very much an opportunity to promote ongoing professional learning. So I view myself as a lifelong learner as do all of you. And so this is something that's very much a key component of the professionalism that comes with National Board Certified Teaching. Um, I was incredibly um, blessed to spend some time in Saginaw, Michigan, home of the best tacos in the state of Michigan, in case people weren't familiar. Um, but uh, thanks to Pam Pugh, I was able to visit Saginaw High, Pam's alma mater, and I spent some time with some remarkable individuals from the Teen Advisory Council, as you can see in that photograph. Um, and these are uh, some, some student leaders who are, care very deeply and very passionately about the work that they do in, Flint, in um, Saginaw, rather, um, to, to make their school the best that it can be. And, and they do so many things in the community, it was really mind-blowing. They even developed uh, a Think Respect pledge that they recite at the beginning of football games and basketball games to create a very meaningful and respectful community in Saginaw. But the, the number of things they do within the school itself is absolutely remarkable, from raising money for breast cancer awareness to mental health, um, awareness and and the overall wellness of their of their school community they really promote uh, a, a powerful culture there that was very palpable on my visit they have um, a, a community clinic there right in Saginaw High School which is a model that I think has been very successful for a lot of schools in in communities that are underserved where where people do not have routine and regular access to quality health care and so I was able to visit this clinic there with Pam and she was obviously very proud as a native of Saginaw to, to, to showcase for me as a first time visitor to Saginaw um, what, what exactly is happening there. I, I was also fortunate to spend some time with these um, remarkable young people who are working in a Lynx program. As many of you know, a Lynx program bridges 
um, students in regular education programs with students who have special needs, in this case children who have autism. And so as we see the Lieutenant Governor comes this afternoon, this is an issue that's very near and dear to his heart. And these students are on the front lines of working directly with students with special needs and making sure they are acclimated on a daily basis in, in their classes and, and they very much feel a part of the school environment. And what's remarkable about the work that these kids are doing is they make it cool for for all kids to embrace children with learning differences and, and to make kids who, who, who ordinarily have, a, have um, some challenges with, with acculturation and socialization to feel very much a part of, of life on a daily basis at Saginaw High School. Um, as you can see, there's Kathleen Strauss. Um, Kathleen Strauss was able to come to a visit um, at my home school, Covington School, um, in the Birmingham Public Schools, and she witnessed a presentation by some students who are doing some hydroponic gardening. And um, so she was able to, to, to see the extent to which um, these students and their teachers are working together to, to really kind of bridge the gap between science learning uh, in classrooms and, and the impact that that has in, in the real world, in, in, um, in our communities. And it's very much like the, the new <coughs> the science standards that we have adopted here statewide. This kind of hands-on um, science learning is incredibly meaningful for all students. This is a student, Carly Cerise. Um, along with Kathleen and a colleague of mine named George Mixon. And Kathleen was able to meet with Carly and talk with Carly. Um, Carly has served as an inspiration to me um, throughout my career as a former student, someone who uh, faces obstacles, as someone who deals with cerebral palsy, but also who has this incredible, indomitable spirit about her. And she um, expects to perform at the same level as her same age peers and, and do the absolute best that she can on a daily basis at Covington. Um, I was also able to visit Loyola Academy, which is a Jesuit school. Jesuit is an order of Catholic priests that, um, that they have a school on the west side of Detroit, which has a, um, a community uh, work program that, that f serves um, these students, these young men who are predominantly African-American, who come from communities where they're, they're chronically underserved. And in this school, um, the, each child in junior and senior year goes out and spends three days of the week in the community. So this individual works at uh, Beaumont Hospital and they have a very unique um, school work partnership. And, and as a result, 100% of their students um, are, are granted access to, to colleges um, upon graduation. And so I was able to witness this model um, happening as, as a potential uh, to emulate statewide. Um, I also had the benefit of providing some professional learning opportunities for students on um, Martin Luther King Jr. Day back in mid-January, and we talked about ways in which, uh, as educators, we can provide a healthy and, um, and welcoming climate, inclusive climate for students who are LGBTQ, and so we did that and talked about that through the use of, of, of literature, literature that enshrines um, characters and, and themes and genre featuring um, LGBTQ individuals. Um, then in turn I went to San Antonio, Texas where I met my colleagues from throughout the United States, all of the other state teachers of the year. Um, and I was very fortunate um, to see the, the extent to which they are working. I must tell you that um, a number of them do not have the benefit of sitting at this board table as I do, so I very much want to echo um, my gratitude um, for the handful of colleagues who have the opportunity to sit as non-voting members at the state board level. It's very interesting to me how some state teachers of the year receive uh, a handshake and a certificate, while um, others are, are, are much more recognized. It truly is, is a very, very disparate approach nationally. So I'm very proud to say that in Michigan, I've had the benefit of having the opportunity to travel throughout the state and witness all the incredible practices that occur and then report them back to you each month. These are my colleagues from the Midwest. Uh, we broke out in regional groups, and I look forward to seeing them again in, in, um, in April when the National Teacher of the Year will be named by President Obama. Um, there are four finalists. I have uh, four remarkable colleagues from the state of Washington, California, Oklahoma, and Connecticut, and any of those four teachers would be outstanding representatives for educators throughout the nation. Um, I had the benefit of spending time with Anne Marie Mapes, who of course many of you know is a consultant here at the Michigan Department of Education and she has been a remarkable liaison for me to the department and we created six word um, poems in regard to our work as advocates and servant leaders and of course you can see mine is, is, is featured there um, as, I, as I have a picture there with Anne Marie, simple acts have the most meaning.
I was also able to visit the Detroit Achievement Academy, which is a not-for-profit charter school on the near west side of Detroit. As John Austin just mentioned, um, th th there's an incredible patchwork of public education offerings, and I wanted to see firsthand um, what was occurring in this particular case, this is a school that prided itself on spending a significant amount of time at the beginning of each school year on creating a healthy culture and climate, which paid dividends throughout the entire year. So they did not dive directly into academic work, as most schools um, realize is, is important to do, and this has uh, significant payoffs for them. They also feature a lot of project-based learning, which enables students to engage in a lot of um, not only projects within the school but also beyond the walls of the school which lend a tremendous amount of meaning and help um, create significant experiences that are rooted in science and social studies for these young children. Um, and I made a few new friends that day which was very, very powerful for me. I'll, as John Austin again mentioned, we, we met a couple of weeks ago here in this room for, uh, there were over 40 stakeholders who um, came together uh, to talk about ways that we as a state can be more inclusive uh, for our students who are LGBTQ, uh, there's a specific emphasis on uh, students who happen to be transgender as this is a, an especially vulnerable population among us. There's a significantly higher rate of suicide among um, LGBTQ students, particularly transgender students, and also there is a significant overrepresentation in our homeless populations, especially among homeless teens for children who are LGBTQ or who are transgender as many of them have been simply thrown out of their homes and disowned by their families. Um, John Austin spoke at the, the SOGI conference. This is the Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Conference uh, hosted by Oakland University. There's a remarkable um, professor there named Tim Larrabee who has um, done this now for six years every year and brought people uh, together throughout the nation to come together and address these very issues for children who are uh, who have sexual orientation or gender identity that is, is, is somehow uh, different from the majority of our students that we serve. Nevertheless, this is a very vulnerable population. I also want to highlight the work of Lori Beckhofer, who is, again, a consultant here at the MDE, who has done absolutely groundbreaking work nationally by creating um, a resource guide for schools throughout um, the nation uh, that, 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 that was born right here in Michigan uh, by, by enabling educators throughout the country to create communities that are inclusive and supportive. Um, this gentleman on the right uh, is from the Tyler Clemente Foundation. And many of you know Tyler Clemente was a student at Rutgers University who uh, tragically committed suicide. So this foundation, um, of which he is a part, is dedicated to providing safe and inclusive environments. Even um, something as, as seemingly innocuous as the bathroom can provide a tremendous challenge uh, for transgender students as they simply do, do not use the washroom all day long because they don't have the benefit of feeling comfortable in either a male or female um, bathroom. So at this conference, we had all gender restrooms as, as not only a political statement, but also a very real awareness of, of the need to be sensitive to this population. Um, there's a book that I'm going to read to you. It's a very brief picture book. It's a true story. It's written by an author named Jessica Herthel and it is based on the life of Jazz Jennings. Jazz Jennings uh, is a transgender girl, now teenager, and I read this book aloud at this conference hosted by Oakland University um, as a way to help put a human face on the uh, reality of life for transgender individuals throughout the nation and the world, especially in schools here in Michigan and beyond. I am Jazz. I am Jazz. For as long as I can remember, my favorite color has been pink. My second favorite color is silver, and my third favorite color is green. Here are some of my other favorite things. Dancing, singing, backflips, drawing, soccer, swimming, makeup, and pretending I'm a pop star. Most of all, I love mermaids. Sometimes I even wear a mermaid tail in the pool. My best friends are Samantha and Casey. We always have fun together. We like <coughs> high heels and princess gowns or cartwheels and trampolines. But I'm not exactly like Samantha and Casey. I have a girl brain, but a boy body. This is called transgender. I was born this way.
When I was very little and my mom would say, you're such a good boy, I would say, no, mama, good girl. At first, my family was confused. They'd always thought of me as a boy. As I got a little older, I, I hardly ever played with trucks or tools or superheroes, only princesses and mermaid costumes. My brothers told me this was girl stuff. I kept right on playing. My sister says I was always talking to her about my girl thoughts and my girl dreams and how one day I would be a beautiful lady. She would giggle and say, you're a funny kid. Sometimes my parents let me wear my sister's dresses around the house. But whenever we went out, I had to put on my boy clothes again. This made me mad. Still, I never gave up trying to convince them. Pretending I was a boy felt like telling a lie. Then one amazing day, everything changed. Mom and Dad took me to meet a new doctor who asked me lots and lots of questions. Afterward, the doctor spoke to my parents and I heard the word transgender for the very first time. That night at bedtime, my parents both hugged me and said, we understand now. Be who you are. We love you no matter what. This made me smile and smile and smile. Mom and Dad told me I could start wearing girl clothes to school and growing my hair long. They even let me change my name to Jazz. Being Jazz felt much more like being me. Mom said that being Jazz would make me different from the other kids at school, but that being different is okay. What's important, she said, is that I'm happy with who I am. Being jazz caused some other people to be confused, too, like the teachers at school. At the beginning of the year, they wanted me to use the boys' bathroom and play on the boys' team in gym class, but that didn't feel normal to me at all. I was so happy when the teachers changed their minds. I can't imagine not playing on the same team as Casey and Samantha. Even today, there are kids who tease me or call me a boy name or ignore me altogether. This makes me feel crummy. Then I remember that the kids who get to know me usually want to be my friend. They say I'm one of the nicest girls in school. I don't mind being different. Different is special. I think what matters most is what a person is like on the inside. And inside, I am happy. I am having fun. I'm proud. I am jazz. I read that um, aloud, as I said, um, to educators at this conference, and most of them had never heard of this story. I'm going to pass a copy of this around. Feel free to look at this. But I think that this is a story that I personally didn't know until I read that book. And um, I profess my ignorance for. Um, you know, the, the transgender community. But again, I think for, for me as an educator, um, and as for the Michigan Teacher of the Year, it's critically important that I help tell stories. That's my job, mm -hmm. is to be a storyteller. And I, I seek to use the stories of other people to illustrate um, stories of which I am not a part. And I Am Jazz is one example of that, especially for people in the transgender community. So I encourage you to... Um, Take a look at that book and uh, consider getting a copy, sharing it. And I certainly will continue to, to tell the story of jazz as I travel around the great state of Michigan as our teacher of the year. Thank you. Thank you very much. John? Um, thank you very much, Rick. And, and the trans kids that I know are at a school where there's a bathroom that is gender neutral, which, as you said, this is one of the small but amazingly important things because when it was broken, they had to go elsewhere in this class. Um, but I wanted to flag your, your um, National Board certification um, point um, for the, it goes back to Richard's question we were talking about our top ten. You know, we are so happy to see that and we need so much to have um, ways to help teachers find satisfying careers 
um, stay have ongoing professional skill building allows them to be excellent teachers to stay teaching versus have to go in administration to kind of get ahead in the profession be master teachers lead teachers and you know, some of you have heard this rap you know, here we have a program that was headquartered here really for many years but uh, we didn't take full advantage of it um, former governor Jim Hunt in North Carolina way back, you know, we need to catch up in education. What's the most important thing in education to help kids learn? It's great teaching. What can we do to help uh, uh, have better quality teaching in our classroom? Uh, and he embraced National Board Certification. They have 18,000 National Board Certified Teachers. Uh, and we have still a few hundred in Michigan. Uh, it's such a powerful strategy to improve learning, particularly for kids who have further to travel, uh, is the great teachers and uh, give them rewards and, and help them find satisfaction in the classroom in their careers teaching or be like teacher of the year. Um, and so Richard, I think to your point, it also, is, as um, Rick indicated, it's one of the few ongoing professional development uh, credentialing programs for teachers that we know uh, has lifts student achievement. And so it's really an important driver. So I thank you, Rick, for reemphasizing that. And thank you for helping us do more of it, I hope. All right, with the board's consent, we're going to move to item H on the agenda, and then I, and then we'll break for lunch. H uh, is the approval of the Energy Career Cluster and Content Standards. At the December 8th board meeting, the board heard a presentation on the Energy Career Cluster Content Standards. Following that presentation, there was a period of public comment, and no comments were received. The board is being asked to approve the standards. The presentation is from the Office of Educational Services, Norma Jean Sass, Deputy Superintendent. So our next step would be to roll out the standards pending board approval. Uh, is there a motion? Yes. Okay. Move the approval. Second. Moved and supported. Is there any discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Bells nay. Motion carries. Gee, that was a great presentation. <laughs> Next item on the agenda, state and federal legislative update. Um, Marty is, is still with us, so Marty will come up and provide an update on federal uh, and state legislative issues. Mm -hmm. And of course, our chair, Cassandra Albrecht, uh, will also be part of the discussion. And then we'll ask Kathleen Strauss if she has any information on NASB updates. Marty? The Legislative Committee meet, met yesterday, um, and there are several pieces of legislation that were discussed. Uh, one is the um, Detroit Public Schools legislation that Brian mentioned earlier about um, kind of redesigning the, the school district down there. And the other one is a, is a group of bills to address um, the teacher sick outs in Detroit and the conditions that, that may have led to that. And the committee talked at length about both of those issues and they have come up with a couple of statements um, to consider and I'll pass it on to Cassandra you uh, so uh, we can take up uh, first the how we do the educate or the Detroit stuff first um, so uh, for Senate Bill 710, um, the Legislative Committee reviewed the legislation and wanted to reaffirm, uh, reaffirm some of our earlier comments about um, the Detroit Public Schools, as well as some um, items that are reflective specifically to the language in the legislation. So we, uh, with the help of the department, we drafted the following statement which says the State Board of Education encourages the legislature to address the following missing elements from Senate Bill 710, a bill that creates community school districts. First, authorize an elected community school board to hire the superintendent for the community school district. B, creation of a Detroit Education Committee to manage the closing and opening of schools within the community district. Elimination of the debt of the qualified school district without extracting resources from the state aid state school aid fund and finally establish set lengths of terms for specific seats on the community district school board so candidates know before the election the exact length of the service on the board um, this statement I don't believe reflects uh, support or opposition one way or the other but certain items that we felt if this legislation was moving forward 
um, should be addressed in the legislation. So with that, we I have will a motion, so we'll put it on the table. It's been moved and supported. Yep. All right, so the uh, item is on the ad agenda. Is there any discussion? I guess for me, there are okay. members of the school board that are out here, and I would really, and I, actually, I was not supporting the motion <laughs> if I was the one who. No, 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 you. No. Okay, gotcha. Okay. No. So I, I guess for me, um, there are members of the school board. So I, and we're a little opposite in how we usually do the agenda. So it right. would have been good since they were able. to Well, make we can it. put it off if you okay. want to hear them yeah. from them after the session. Or? Oh, that's yeah. Thank you. I move to table. Can I ask a question just for clarifying mm -hmm. what's, what's here? Um, <clears throat> is is the community school district is that the new new DPS mm -hmm. school? Yes. Yes. Um, so, and the Detroit Education Committee would have opening and closing within that. I, I believe that's supposed to be commission. Commission. It's the DEC. Yeah. The okay. what is not included in the legislation so, yeah. now. So B is intended to have. We can some, change committee to commission. Some entity, if, if it's helpful to not yes. call it a commission, call it a. Entity that would manage opening and closing um, of charters and the DPS community school district schools. Yeah, so okay. it it says within the community district, but it, what it should say is within Detroit, Detroit. basically. Within the city it of Detroit. It should say within the city of Detroit, not within the school district. City of Detroit. Yes, good catch. All right, so we'll wait on this until this afternoon when uh, after public okay. comment. All right. I see the president of the Detroit School Board is here, um, Lamar Lemons. I was just, Pam, you were suggesting we wait till they are here. Until they um, speak at public comment. So they can do public comment. Okay. If um, one's thought is if they're here and right. unless we're expecting more, we could entertain the public comment now. Um, that's that up to the board. All right, we'll invite Lamar Lemons to come up if you'd like to make some comments. Sure. Hope you caught your breath, Lamar. I didn't mean to. <laughs> Oh. Um, can I in our, can I do one thing real real quick? I just saw Senator Kinesic walk in the room, and I I know he's got to get to another meeting. So can I call him up real sure. quick, and then we'll come right back to you. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Trying to respect. Uh, I know you have other meetings. Uh, I Thank just you, left them uh, uh, presenting. Uh, first of all, is the position of the duly elected Detroit Board of Education that we vehemently, most strenuously. Uh, oppose yes. Senate Bid 710 and 711. We vehemently, most stringently oppose uh, the creation of so-called community district. We vehemently and, and, and most stringently oppose the DEC, which is nothing but a mayoral po power grab, which will, and it, so he plays both sides against the, the, the middle. He goes on one side and says, this will restrict charters. He goes to the charter side and, and says, this will, we will allow you to have these charters. I can give you charter schools. At the same time, he takes money from all these people. And, it's, and, and so we vehemently, most stringently oppose. He takes money and you're allowing the mayor to appoint a board who knows <coughs> their board, where their bread is buttered. So we oppose that. That's number one. Now, n number two, the, um, what we want is what you, you all have for your own respective districts, which is local Democratic elected school board, fully empowered. The DEC creates this other entity that has most of the powers of an elected board. And if they appoint a superintendent that cannot be fired, how can that district be held, account uh, held accountable for the outcomes? It's absurd. This is more Jim Crow. This is more, uh, this is more, this is more discrimination against the largest black district. And part of what has been, is been what, part of the reason why this is happening, because some of you who run, particularly in partisan ra races, in Detroit, we gave more votes to the last uh, uh, 150,000 plus votes to the people uh, and who are on this board. So we expect you to at least take our consideration because that was the difference between um, uh, being the other party sitting in your place. So and um, and so th this removal of this removal of the uh, of the uh, uh, partisan. Um, straight party ticket directly. All this works together, uh, works together to eliminate uh, your authority and to eliminate the authority of our elected board. Um, we had a surplus when the state intervention came into place, 114 million surplus. And by the way, the first reform CEO, Mr. David Adamati, came and reported back to the legislature, which I happen to be a member of that time, and he reported that Detroit was the number one school district in the nation 
for students with free and reduced lunch. In other words, no other school district with 100,000 students or more came close to the academic performance. He also reported back to the state legislature that people from all over the country came to see what we were doing uh, to educate these kids, who are, which uh, in most cases are the most hard to educate because of the social economic conditions. So when they took over the district, it couldn't have been for academics. We, we tested in the middle of the state. When they took over the district, it was not for uh, finances because we had 114 million surplus. They took it over because we had $1.5 billion bonds and they didn't want to, uh, to, to share the money, so they came, and came up with Public Act 10. At the end, they left the district in debt. They left, they, they returned it for a, a brief two-year period, and they left the district with a $1 billion in obligations, encumbrances, and uh, leases and contracts. $1 billion. It didn't sh all show in the book. We also, the state also imposed us to borrow a bond at 21% interest rate. So the, the, after two years, the board said, we can't handle it. They asked for an emergency financial manager, and they would concentrate on education. The emergency f financial manager said, I can't, uh, uh, um, I'm not going to fix it. He said, I could fix it, but it hurt kids. So he and bloomed the deficit another 100 million. And so we took him to court and we prevailed. What was the legislature's response? Public Act 4. The citizen, but because the legislature and the governor were neophytes, they didn't, they didn't think about that they should put a, a, a appropriations in it. So they didn't, so the people repealed it to show their intent. So now you go, what, what was their response? Again, a Jim Crow legislation in PA 436. I say Jim Crow because they had the infamous grandfather clause. So even though the people mm -hmm. uh, repealed P Public Act 4, it, it said, in PA 436, it said any district that had previously been under PA 4. So they put us under a non-existing law. Any district that had been under Public Act 72 or PA 4 would now be under PA 436. So that means we did not get a neutral evaluation. And, 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 and finally, on that point, on the, the emergency manager law has uh, a, 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 a clause in it that essentially says that uh, the 18 month uh, uh, period is uh, for emergency manager, not emergency management. So what do they do? Every uh, 17 months, 29 days, they bring in another emergency manager and, 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 and the clock starts all over again. That is the condition that we're in. We want to be, these are all headly violations. We had a $114 million surplus. It should be due a Hippocratic oath. I will do no harm. We should have $114 million. We had 92% of the market share, 92% of the students in the city of Detroit. Now we have only 40%. Why? Because they were trying to destroy the district to make it less appealing for charters. And now you're going to let allow someone, the mayor, who wants to get the contracts, to, to open up schools willy-nilly as he so see fit. And those are functions of, and it also in, in, impedes the, uh, a school district and the school board's ability to create programs because they have to go to the mayor Duggan to say can I close the school can I open this program can I put that program father may I we're not we, the, the school board should be the same as in your district and unless you want a mayor control in your district unless you're advocating this mayor control don't Jim Crow don't support anything to, for the choice specific just give us what you have thank you thank you Lamar did anybody else from Detroit come to testify I would like to say something. sure John Telford. Good to uh, see you, John. I'm, I was the appointed superintendent of the school board, and I will be very brief. Uh, I simply would like to say that what has happened to these children is unconscionable. Uh, they had a $114 million surplus, as, as Lamar stated. Uh, we need to have an elected school board reinstituted and their appointed superintendent reinstituted immediately. These are the things that need to happen if justice is to prevail. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you very much. I see both senators are here, so if they'd like to come up. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Didn't I? Yep. She's a school board. Yep. Sorry. Good afternoon. My name is Tawana Simpson. I'm a member of the Detroit Board of Education. And I also oppose um, Senate Bill 710 and 711 and the creation of a um, DEC with Detroit. Um, Mayor Duggan was elected under the same emergency manager law that I was as a school board member and um, I'm, it, it just makes no sense to me. I think the conversation should be repealing, for, repealing PA 436 and putting a cap on charter if we really want to create a level playing field and um, really talk about educating our students here in, in Detroit as well as Michigan. Thank you. Thank you. Did anybody else from Detroit come up to testify? Good morning. 
morning. Good Patricia morning. Singleton, Detroit Board of Education. I also Thank you. Uh, would request Senate Bill 710 not be passed. The stakeholders of Detroit have spoken. They want the same rights as other districts. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else from Detroit? All right, with that, I would invite Senator Hansen and Senator Kinesic to come up. They wanted to come up and talk about the top 10 and 10, I think. And anything else they'd like to share? Thank you for being here, Senators. Thank you, sir. Sure. I just wanted to take an op opportunity to say thank you for your uh, 10 and 10 that you, you've been working on so diligently and the uh, work and the time that's been put into I think that it's, uh, it's a huge help for us as we look forward to where we're trying to go, how we're trying to uh, kind of shape the educational system and make sure we know what the goals are and the inclusion is great. Uh, I, I've been telling Ben that you know he's going to be moving into an office in my office here real soon because he's been sending, spending so much time in my office, which is which is good because we definitely have to reach out. We have to work together because at the end of the day we're all trying to get to the same thing. It's just we have to kind of work together and form the the solution that we want that we feel that is the best for the kids in the state. And uh, uh, this I think is a good start. I think it's. Uh, it's great to have a roadmap that we're trying to follow a little bit more so we can, you know, hopefully make us top 10. Top one would be great. I, you know, I'm so tired, like of, <laughs> so tired of hearing about, you know, Massachusetts and Florida and Tennessee and Minnesota. Florida is and so I'm waiting for that fifth one, you know, because then we have half of the, uh, we've got the lower peninsula. We've just got to, you know, mm -hmm. we want Michigan in there so we can get, get so we are the ones that people look to. I, I think we can get there, and I think by uh, by working together we can get that. So I appreciate it. So just by way of introduction, uh, my name is David Knizek, and I'm the state senator for the 5th District. I represent Detroit, Dearborn Heights, Garden City, Inkster, uh, and Redford Township. Um, I'll be very brief in, in the hopes that uh, we might be able to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, and to echo Senator Hansen's statements, uh, from a legislative perspective, <coughs> excuse me, uh, just really appreciate the outreach that the department has done uh, to include us in this process, this planning process to develop uh, the top 10 and 10 strategies moving forward. Uh, a lot of times, to be forthright with you, uh, the relationship between the legislature and some members of different departments uh, are not the most collegial. Uh, and so the fact that uh, both Superintendent Whiston, uh, Ben Williams, uh, Kyle Garant uh, have spent a significant amount of time uh, engaging the legislature in this process, I think, increases the amount of buy-in that we're going to have and increase the likelihood of success for everyone across the board. And so, again, just simply wanted to state my appreciation uh, for the teamwork that the department has displayed uh, over the last couple months, um, and we'll be happy to answer any questions or comments that you might have at this time. So this is on top 10 and 10 that we're <laughs> discussing. I want to make sure we don't open the doors to other things unless the senators wish to. But. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Should, should I have introduced myself? <laughs> should I have introduced myself before I started? That was nice, Dave, that uh, you did. Senator Hanson, uh, yes, please. Yeah, Senator Jeff Hanson, 34th District, Muskegon, Oceana, and Nuevo Counties. Mm -hmm. Sandra? Well, first of all, thank you for coming. We don't often get um, the privilege of having some members come over and, and uh, talk to us about something that's a positive thing, so we really appreciate you coming. Um, the top 10 and 10 thing that we put together today has a lot of work went into it, and I think there's a lot of really good stuff in it. Um, but as John mentioned earlier, there's, there's one thing that it kind of brushes uh, along, but doesn't really specifically say it in it, so I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, we have a, an educational system and a funding system that are incongruent. And they're putting so much pressure on each other that one of them is going to break. And what I'm talking about is the fact that we have a funding system that's based on headcount, but we have an educational system that allows for um, an open marketplace of education. So even though we've had over a decade of declining student enrollment, we've had uh, in the same time about 160 new schools created um, in the state of Michigan which has led to uh, what everyone said was competition was going to raise everybody up has actually as you see we have some folks here from Detroit who can tell you that that's not been the case and we have been one of a handful of states that has actually gone backwards um, as opposed to moving forward and I think it's because of the policies that we've put in place that have created this system where 
the, the structure and the funding system just don't work together. So my question is, what do we do about it? So before <laughs> the senator's <laughs> answer, which they oh, look, give a chance at second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Since we're opening that other door, I do thank Senator Hansen and Senator Kinesiak who are working together to try to shape a future for Detroit. And I, I do want to thank them for Senator Hansen for taking the lead on trying to come up with legislation. And I know Senator Kinesiak is working very hard with you to try to come up with a solution along with the governor's office. And there's always differences, uh, and I appreciate that. But I do appreciate the fact that uh, you're trying to come up with a solution and that you've been in Detroit, you have visited, you have invited conversations from all across you know, the spectrum. And so I thank you for that. And if you wish to comment, that's up to you. Well, I guess I can start out by saying is, is you kind of hit on part of the challenge of people that want the best for their kids. There's a lot of different ideas on how that happens. Not everybody goes down the same road of what they think is the right way to do it. And I think that um, as we move forward, it's a discussion piece that we need to have. And um, solutions are the hardest part to come with. You know, we 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 have failed a bit on where we're at. We shouldn't be as far down as we should we are at this point. But the answer to where we, how do we get to a top 10, I think is, uh, first of all, I, I applaud you for taking it on and saying, finally saying where we want to be. I mean, not just that we want to continue going on because what we were doing wasn't exactly working either. So I, I don't know the exact solution. I, and I not even profess that I do. I, you know, I, there's an awful lot of experts that we need to talk to. The people that are on the ground, the people that are in the schools teaching our kids are, are the ones that have to be part of this mm -hmm. solution. We have, to, we have to pay attention to all sides of this and not you know, try to just, I, I think everybody coming together and, and creating some kind of a, a, a plan or a, a road map like we have, I think makes a huge difference. And I would just probably add, you know, from, from my own personal perspective, I've said this since, uh, you know, I was first elected to the House of Representatives. You know, the system that we have related to school funding, in my personal opinion, uh, doesn't work and, and isn't equitable in a way that uh, the greatest resources are driven to the areas of the greatest need, right? And so to have a conversation on reworking uh, the funding system here in Michigan, I think, is one that we need to have. Obviously, it's going to be a huge lift. I think we can, can accept that from the get-go. Uh, but it's a lift that I think the legislature needs to be willing to take on. And to your point about, you know, sort of the competitive nature that we have within the system of education right now, uh, I talk to folks who are, um, you know, very uh, strong supporters of, of choice and what choice uh, provides parents in their opinion. And they've shared with me that uh, though they support choice, they could have never foreseen the true impact that it might have had on, you know, sort of the, the competitiveness that we have for getting students into the classroom to make sure we have that quality headcount to make sure that we get the funding that we need. Uh, and so I think that's why it's so critically important that we get that conversation right within the city of Detroit as we're talking about Detroit public schools. Uh, because what you see now with uh, the enrollment in DPS leveling off for, for all intents and purposes, uh, it's not a conversation of, you know, charters trying to take students away from public schools anymore so much as it is charters also trying to take students away from other charters and you know which is obviously runs contrary to what the choice movement would want as well and so that system uh, the wild wild west if we will that we have allowed to perpetuate itself uh, in some of our most urban areas such as Detroit uh, has led us to many of the financial difficulties uh, amongst other things that we have right now and so I would welcome that conversation uh, with you and uh, I can't speak for the senator but uh, it's certainly something that <laughs> that uh, that I think is in need of being addressed uh, and is something that we the legislature should uh, should take on I'd be happy to have a conversation mm -hmm. with both of you if you are open to it thank you John and the re really appreciate you being here and um, appreciate the good relationships and thank you Brian we obviously made a good choice to work together with you all across <coughs> party lines because there is much in our agenda now with top 10 that we can advance together 
uh, from early childhood to helping more kids get post-secondary education to teacher quality. Um, and I really also appreciate your attention. Some of what we are talking about and want to work on together is how we get resources where they're needed, uh, to, where kids have further to travel, uh, David. Um, but I also, we noted this morning and appreciate your willingness to continue to work together on, uh, we, we have s still not managed to make this marketplace of education deliver quality outcomes uh, as we need. And, and my own hope, and I very much, Senator Hanson, appreciate your leadership uh, on bringing the Detroit legislation forward, that if we can include in that some way to manage for quality and good outcomes and access all public schools in Detroit, uh, we could find a prototype uh, for how we could uh, apply the same sort of uh, quality learning outcomes as the focus management to public education in other places where we have a marketplace that exists, uh, which is a lot of Michigan now. So I hope we can find a way to do this well with Detroit and appreciate your leadership on SANE and your interest in trying to find that solution because we won't have the kids learning as they need uh, unless we can uh, find that way to, to manage a public education system that delivers the goods, which is high quality learning. Rick, and then I, I know they both have told me they've got a commitment, so we got to get them out of here as soon as we can, but Rick? Thank you, Senator Hanson, Senator Knizek, thank you so much. As Michigan's Teacher of the Year, I just want to echo how exciting it is to see the bipartisan support that you embody when you sit before us here at our table. And I also want you to know that when I visit teachers across the state, they want to know what, what they can do, what we can do as educators to be advocates and co-partners in helping make sure that our schools are the best that they can be. So um, when I went to see Senator Nolander back, back in October, my home senator, um, he was thrilled that I, I was there, and he was just excited that I would take the time to be with him. So what would you suggest as, as our, our legislators that we as, as educators do to communicate with you so that we can be co-partners in making Michigan the top 10 in 10? I, I certainly look forward to uh, any time I can talk with our local uh, educators. My daughter-in-law is a uh, teacher up in the Muskegon area, so I do get some input back from her on you know what t kind of things where she's hearing on the ground. But trying to get to what the solution looks, I, I think we have to rely more on on some of our educators and for them to, to bring us some ideas that we can utilize is is big. And I, I think we have to take some of the. I think we have to take some of the chains off a little bit and allow them to actually try some try some things. I think that sometimes we put too many, you know, too many, you know, you have to do this, 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 and this, rather than letting them w actually do the work that they've been trained to do. And I think that, you know, we've got some great educators in the state of Michigan. It's just give them freedom to be as great as they can be you know let them and, it, and I found I my business I was in the grocery business for 30 years and and if you enable people to to try new things it, it kind of sparks an interest back in them rather than you know, it gets them out of the rut that sometimes they get into if you allow them to to try to um, you know, anything new Something that they've read about, something they've they've seen, of, you know, that has worked somewhere else. Give some opportunities, and I think that, and then they can share it if it works. I think that that's a lot of it is making sure that we're we're kind of listening. I, I think just to sort of double up on what Senator Hansen said, you know, the engagement piece you talked about really is key, right? And so I think of you know my own personal experience. Uh, I, I don't pretend to be, you know, a 20-year educator. Studied at the School of Education at U of M Dearborn. I did all my student teaching at Dearborn Public Schools. Uh, my brother's a high school chemistry and, and calculus teacher. My mom's a lunch lady. And my aunt's retiring this year from Dearborn Public Schools as well. Um, we as legislators have to be humble enough to acknowledge the fact uh, that we're not experts in everything. And when it comes time to make decisions about the system of education in the state, we need to rely heavily on the opinions and the feedback and the thoughts of the educators who are doing it on the ground every day. One of the most dangerous things that we see coming out of, uh, I'll say, the Senate Committee on Education uh, is decisions related to education being made by people who have no concept of how those decisions will impact our teachers and our parents and our students 
uh, what I would call sort of boots on the ground, right? And so it's incumbent upon us, and one of the things that I've enjoyed about working with Senator Hansen is that though disagreements are expected between the two of us, uh, he's genuine in his approach. He's tried to take himself outside of, uh, I don't want to say his comfort zone, but to place himself um, with the parents, with the teachers, with the system, uh, that his decisions will ultimately affect one day. That is the most that we could ever ask of a legislator who's making a decision relative to education. I think it's incumbent upon certainly you as the board, uh, as teachers, as administrators, as parents, uh, to do everything you can really to, to force our hand uh, to listen to the feedback that you can provide because again, it is our decisions that are going to affect uh, your way of life and the way of life of, of these children. We have a ton of conversations in Lansing about uh, things not entirely related to the people who matter the most, and that's the kids. And, and so the feedback that we can get from each and every one of you really heightens that level of discourse uh, and I believe leads to better outcomes in the end. And, and if I may, I'd, I'd like to say that you know, as folks come forward, we get a lot of times what we get are the complaints. And I would like some solutions to come with some of the things that they may come up with because you know we know a lot of the issues but some of the, the the thoughtful solutions that we can actually implement that makes a big difference is is how we can try and work towards some of the solutions you know we may not always agree Dave and I don't always agree but we're not disagreeable I mean it's it's a matter of trying to get to the to the right answer because everything we're doing at the end of the day is you're hoping to get to the right answer. I know that both senators got to go, so I'm going to end it with Michelle. Michelle, go ahead. I know Ms. Strauss also had her oh, hand raised before. Okay. Oh, I didn't see I that. I want to leave quick, her out. Oh, um, on the coalition uh, for the future to train school children, there was a, an array of um, ideas and solutions put out there. And um, one of the, and, and although many on the committee, and I was on the policy committee, and oh, by the way, you're my senator. I know very well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my nephews and all that. Um, so, uh, in, in, and it was a consensus document that was really tough to reach with a broad array of people, and although I didn't 100% agree with everything, there were a lot of things I thought, it, was, it wasn't a, a table of solutions or ideas mm -hmm. that I think, and I, um, one of the ones that I wanted to highlight, which seems to be a real sticking point, I'm also a resident of Detroit, as I repeat, I raised a uh, parent of 18 children within the city over the last 25 years. I currently have three kids in Detroit Public Schools, and I have, um, uh, including kids with autism and some other special needs. So I've been dealing in Detroit in the schools, and I've sent my children to charters, and I've sent my kids out across district. So, sorry, AMT. <laughs> um, the, so I've struggled with all these choices and things. So I, I, I think I can speak with, with some, you know, uh, Detroit is a diverse group of people with many different opinions. And we, um, so there's, but one thing that we see, there seems to be some consensus is on having a um, locally elected, uh, because it, 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 it uh, a, a locally elected board so if there is control over the um, the charters, and I know other school districts and other, you know, this is an issue not just for Detroit and Pontiac, but also uh, Livingston <coughs> County communities and Canton, the school boards have no control over or say over when charters come in and out. And they were the people who are elected by the community to have a say in running that community. So I, uh, in, um, and I know it's not just Detroit that is grappling with this, with this issue, it's communities across the state. So, um, and I'm not sure exactly what kind of mechanism in the Coalition for the Future of Detroit School Children, children they came up with some ideas of really engaging the community and having, um, uh, really looking at uh, like these issues of certificate of need with community engagement. Um, so I, I don't understand the resistance to allowing that, and I and I, um, I can, you know I can speculate, but I could be wrong. Uh, so I think that that's going to be as a as a resident and activist, education activist in Detroit, that's going to be it's going to be um, it's going to be hard to overcome not having um, uh, some sort of local control check power over that over that. 
and um, and as and I think Republicans do support the issue of local control. So I'm having a really hard time getting my hands around that. Well, you, you had a lot of things in there. I know <laughs> I said I could take, take a, and I wasn't, take a quick stab. Is first of all the um, school board is elected to oversee the local school district. Right. The district that they represent, not the, not the area, and and, and you you, it, it is a huge challenge because the end of the day, we, you know, I'm not I'm not in this to make a statement. I'm in this to find solutions. Just making a statement doesn't get it done, and I want to make sure that at the end of the day, we can get this done, and it works. And so trying to work with everybody all the way around, whether it's, you know, DPS or whether it's charter, has been part of what I think the solution has to be. It can't be a one-sided solution. It has to be a, an area solution. It has to have input from all sides. I took this on because a lot of the things that I have done before have been bringing the sides together. That's one of my strengths. And I think that as we're trying to do this, I'm, you know, we're, we're having meetings face to face so that we can have these discussions. The, the schism between the educational systems is, is really difficult to be able to sometimes you know, bring them together. And I think that by sitting everybody down, having conversations, and we've been very careful, and I appreciate the, you know, my friends from from Detroit, we've been very careful not to do this in the public. This is not, I mean, we have to have very frank conversations and we can't fight this in the newspaper. This has to be, these have to be personal conversations that we have so we understand where we're at. And I think that they've done a great job of that. And, and you know, you're hitting on a lot of the challenges that we have. Yeah, I, I did see the, and, and we've done a lot of the things that the coalition wants. Are we going to be able to do everything? No, probably not. But it's a lot closer than, than where we started. I think that by having the conversations, I think we are a lot further along than where we were. And I think that I hope that we can get to a good resolution on this. Thank you. So the, the, the way I would respond to your comment is, you know, while the, the nuance of what that may or may not look like at the end of the day is still being sorted out, I sort of, uh, uh, keep a core set of values or information you know near my heart as we have those conversations moving forward and chief among those is you know we could pay off all the debts uh, which the state should do all the debts that were incurred under state and management the state has responsibility to pay off in my opinion and I think it's a general consensus at this point that that will happen uh, we could pay off all the debts we could introduce a ton of great wraparound services, we could do X, Y, and Z. But if we don't have a way of managing that landscape, uh, my fear is that we're going to be right back where we are five to 10 years from now uh, of where we're at today. And so consider for a moment, and I know being on the coalition, you may be familiar with these numbers, consider for a moment Northeast Detroit, where we have over 6,000 school age kids in two high schools. And you go to the Woodward Corridor where we have 1,800 school age kids and 11 high schools. And you go to the southern portion of my district into Brightmore where I've got a 30 by 30 block area with no schools. And so there's no rhyme or reason right now to who, what, where, when, and why uh, a school opens. And again, to my original point, though I don't know what that final conversation may or may not look like, uh, I think it's incumbent upon us to keep that information at the forefront of those discussions. Uh, to make sure that we can address the problem and ensure that we aren't right back where we are now five or ten years down the road. All right, Kathleen, and then we're going to adjourn for lunch. Well, I wanted to thank you for being here, too. And I wanted to thank Senator Hansen for his multiple visits to Detroit to try to find out what really the situation is on the ground. And we've had uh, members of the uh, locally elected board come here and tell us what they think, and I think it's, it's really great that you have gone to Detroit and tried to find out what the situation is down there. And I'm very impressed with, with Senator Nizek. I agree with your statements. I've been pushing for changes in the, in the finance system for years, and I'm so glad that you are now saying that as well. And we have been saying it here as a board 
to, we have to do something to update how we fund the schools and how we distribute the funds. Not only how we collect them, but how we distribute them. And all the things that you have said about the, the almost amazingly, without any rhyme or reason, system that we've got in Detroit now just breaks my heart. I've been at this for 50 years. I mean, it's, it's awful. I ran a millage campaign in, in, in 1966 because the schools were so overcrowded and they were on double sessions. And now we're down to 40, there were almost 300,000 students then. We're down to 47,000 students. And the, the, what Cassandra said earlier about the system that we've created and allowed to grow has almost destroyed the Detroit public school system. It hasn't destroyed it because we've been in schools and the day that you were there, that we went on the tour, uh, we saw schools that are really functioning very well. But that's not all of the schools. We know that some of the schools are not functioning very well. But we also know that the children that come to those schools have multiple problems that many other places would never even know existed. And we have to take that into consideration and the wraparound services that you we have to do something with the social services and health services for the, for the families. That's essential. So whether this is the solution or not, I don't know. I, I'm very hesitant to support it. But I know that you're trying to come up with a solution. And we have to, I, I want to help come up with a solution that will keep people in Detroit, if not happy, uh, not terribly unhappy. <laughs> I don't know how to put it, but we're not going to get everything we want. I know that. But we, I think we should get more of what we want than, than is on the table right now. <coughs> so I commend both of you and I thank you and I hope we can help. Thank you. We we spend have to, we, as you say, Senator Hanson, we have to come up with a solution. We can't just keep talking about it. Right. And, and we've spent and, but I'm glad to hear you say that, that, that Paying off the debt is, is going to happen. That's absolutely essential for starters. But we've spent a lot of time together in the last few months, <laughs> <laughs> and along, along with uh, his colleagues, and we've had a lot of discussions. Yeah, well. So I thank you for being here and your comments on top 10 and 10, and I thank you for engaging the conversation on Detroit and for you know your both of your leadership in trying to resolve the issues. It is a tough job. You are both listening and trying to come up with a craft a solution that works. So I thank you for your time and commitment and thank you for being here. We'll be adjourned till one o'clock.